everyone. Welcome to the production of your session. We have four rooms running in parallel, all with very interesting presentations, and we are free to move between rooms. At the end of each presentation, there will be a question and answer session. You can make questions during the presentation in the Q&A chat that you can find in the right side of your screen with a question mark icon. As a church person of this test, you have John Trujillo, Gulf Head of Questions and Process, for more than six years, with over 19 years of experience, being 16 in the flow assurance area, working in the oil and gas projects at all stages of our field's life in Venezuela, Australia, and Portugal, as well as in the development of the compact separation technologies and multi-phase multi flow models. George holds a degree in mechanical engineering. Please welcome George, and the floor is yours. Thank you, Natalia, for your kind words. Uh, welcome, everybody, to the production assurance uh, session of today. Uh, we're going to start with Andres Biscaino from Schlumberger. Andres uh, has more than 10 years of experience in the industry. He has specialized in flow assurance and multi-phase flow numerical simulations. He has worked in a wide range of projects and places, from onshore to offshore, from heavy oil to gas condensate, in many uh, geographies, including Asia, Africa, South America, and Europe. He holds a Bachelor in Chemical Engineering from the Universidad de Oriente and a Master in Fluid Mechanics from the Institut de Mecanique de, de Fluids de Toulouse and a postgraduate studies in data science from Ecole Polytechnique in Paris. Andres will be presenting us the innovative approach in pig in operation optimization using multiphase flow numerical simulation. Andres, the floor is yours. Thank you, George. Uh, I guess you see my screen correctly. Not yet. Reshare again, okay? Okay. It's supposed to be shared now. Nothing yet. Now, right? Yes, now you can start, Andres. Let me just close this window and focus on this presentation. Thank you, everybody, for your interest in this presentation, which is called Innovative Approach in Peak and Operation Optimization. My name is Andres Ikeida, and my first position is in the technical consultant for all the local technologies for Europe. Andres, sorry, uh, when when, whenever you did something, it went away again, the, the screen. Ah, uh, okay. Not yet. Let me just stop my video because uh, I... Okay, there it is. Okay, so any, any, any time that I start my video, the presentation drops out, so I will just focus on the presentation now. So let me just start again again. Oh. So as I mentioned before, thank you for your interest in this presentation. And uh, as uh, George mentioned, my name is Andres Vizcaino and I'm a senior technical consultant for our production tool in Europe. Here is the agenda for today's presentation. Uh, I'm going to give you some background about pigging operation. Uh, first, starting by the purpose of a pigging, elements of a pigging system, the pigging system options, then we're going to move on uh, the design consideration and challenges uh, designing a PIGIN program. 
then we're going to discuss briefly the tools that we use to optimize these type of operations. And then I have selected two cases which I think I think will be relevant for this audience uh, to illustrate how we perform this type of uh, operation. And finally, we're going to highlight some of the conclusions and then move on to the Q&A session. Now, let's start with the purpose of the PIGIN. So, PIGIN, uh, a pipeline, is introducing a mechanical device inside the oil and gas pipeline in order to ensure that it's clean and free of obstruction of any kind. And that way, ascertain the integrity of the pipeline through the lifetime of the field. The main purpose of a PIGIN is to maintain the original integrity and flow performance of the pipe by cleaning and inspection to prevent any excessive buildup of wax scale sands and so on by scrapping the, the, the wall of the interior of a pipeline with, uh, with the mechanical device and to displace any accumulation of water or any other fluid that might be corrosive, especially if it's low, low points in the pipeline. In addition to apply any corrosive inhibitor biocide and as well to serve as a physical barrier when you're transporting two fluid in the same pipeline. Now, moving on to describe the elements of a PIGIN, here I have a very uh, simple diagram and which com uh, has all the elements of a PIGIN system. First, we have uh, uh, the launcher or the production flow rate as well and the characterization. The importance of the production flow rate and characterization of this fluid is that we need to determine the amount of flow rate that we're going to reduce or perhaps shut down completely that particular line or well and also to see the compatibility of the propellant fluid with the production flow rate to, uh, that doesn't cause any other uh, damage that is, for, that is meant to be. The second element is the peak and propellant fluid. And the peak itself is very important since we need to determine the size, the ID, the, the shape or the material that is composed this peak. And as well the propellant fluid. The propellant fluid is the uh, pressure source or the fluid that provides the pressure source or the force to move or drive the peak from point A to point B. And by sizing correctly this propellant fluid, selecting the correct uh, fluid and the flow rate, we're going to control correctly the velocity of the peak inside my pipeline. Now that I mentioned pipeline, it's the next element of my system. Uh, in the pipeline, we need to take into consideration JD, uh, any restrictions or change of the diameter in the pipeline, as well as any valve that can block or create an obstruction of my peak. And finally, we have the receiver facilities and the process capacity. Uh, basically, because when we're going to run peak operations, we're going to create extra volume, and we need to handle this extra volume at our facilities. And we need to size correctly those facilities for any scenario, especially for picking operations, since this is most of the time our constraint or limitation factor. Now that we have seen the picking system element, let's discuss a few options that we have available to select. First, let's start with the pick. So the pick, there are several types of picks. We have foam picks, sphere picks, mandrel picks, solid cast picks. In this example, I have two uh, main picks. The first one, which is on the top, is the foam pick. The foam picks are more suitable for pipelines. We are not frequently uh, run any picking operation because they, are ha they have more flexibility and have more wear resistance or any obstruction that may have in the pipeline. Those picks are made mainly from pillow terrain and they come from different range of density, meaning the lower density being more flexible and wear resistant than the higher density. On the bottom, we have what is called a mandrel pick, which is basically a shaft in which we can insert different components uh, for different purpose of the picking operation. But mainly, it, it's, it must have two uh, elements. The first one will be the sealing component, which is going to help to drive the pick for, uh, to the receiver facilities, and also the cleaning system or the cleaning component, the one they're going to scrap the pipe wall in order to remove any solid uh, deposit that may have. Independently of the peak that we're going to use, uh, either foam, mandrel, or solid cast, we need to have certain variables to characterize numerically this element inside the pipeline. And that's what the picture that I have into my right. I will not go much into detail of, of any other forces that we need to characterize this peak, but I would like to highlight that all this information is easily available by you requesting to the peak vendor, or you can use the default value in the open literature. So there is no difficulty to characterize any peak using numerical simulation using this tool. 
Another type of options that we have when designing a picking system is the propellant fluid. How, how we're gonna create the forces to move the peak uh, to the to the end uh, of a bike pipeline or the end of our system. And we have two main categories: liquid liquid propellant fluid and gas propellant fluid. For liquid propellant fluid, we have water. The main advantage of water is that inexpensive and mostly available, especially offshore. If we're discussing about in the desert, then it's a different story. But the disadvantage of water is that it might create hydrate, so we need to consider as well using any inhibitor to avoid that hydrate formation. In addition, water mixed with wax, it might harden those wax deposition, so a lab analysis needs to be run before to prove that it doesn't cause any damage or uh, decrease the performance of a picking operation. Another option for liquid propellant is use our own production fluid or produce crude or lease another crude. This normally is relatively expensive and available. Another option as well is diesel, which is an excellent propellant fluid because it have a, it's a solvent, so it can dissolve some of the wax deposition that is in the pipeline and it helps to remove those. But also it can be expensive for high volume, so it's limited to the size of the pipeline and the length of the pipeline. Moving on to the gas, uh, we can have the produced gas or the buyback gas, and normally this option is inexpensive and normally available. Second, we have nitrogen, which is inert gas, but it becomes very expensive for high volume. And also, we'd like to ha highlight that air is not considered due to safety risk. Now, when we go on to design uh, a, a program or a picking operation, we need to take into consideration several factors. And I have highlighted here the main factors and some of the challenges, and I will go one by one to, to, to exemplify or to explain a little bit what about the same consideration. So main, the first one is the flow rate. The flow rate is very important for two reasons. So we need to consider the, flow, the production flow rate. Are we gonna to, to decrease how much? Are we gonna shut down completely our, our facility or pipeline? And also the propellant fluid. Are we gonna use a different fluid to uh, drive our peak to the end destination? And also the compatibility between these two and how we gonna shut down or reduce those flow rate in order to run the peak operation. The main challenge is here is to avoid the reduction of production uh, flow rate uh, in order to avoid or to reduce the non-productive time of our field. The second point is the peak arrival time. The peak arrival time is how much time uh, take the peak from point A to point B. And the idea to do this or the main challenge is to maximize, uh, to minimize this arrival time in order to minimize any production losses. Just to remember, the more time we spend running the peak operation, the less, the more time we're losing any production. So, in order to reduce the arrival time, we need to increase velocity. And that's our next point: peak velocity. We need to maximize. We try to maximize the peak velocity, but we take in consideration the peak integrity. If we go too fast for a particular line or a particular peak, then the the peak integrity will be compromised. In addition to that, we can we generate the peak velocity by the propellant fluid, and we need to have full control of the propellant fluid flow rate to uh, control that peak velocity. The next point is the bone front capacity, uh, and that means any the capacity of the front facility that we have to handle any extra volume generated through the peaking operation. Uh, as I mentioned before, this is normally the limitation factor of our picking operation, and we need to slow down or reduce the picking frequency of this limitation mm -hmm. and Finally, the frequency. Some of the peak operations are run frequently, and we need to, to increase the frequency of running this peak operation, since by doing so, we reduce our not productive time in the field but without compromising the normal operations, uh, the optimal operation of normal conditions in our system. Now, I would like to spend one slide on describing the, the tool that we use to in order to uh, determine all these variables in a quantitative and rigorous manner. The multi-phase flow simulator for those who are not familiar with is called OGA. It's a transit model that means that change over time it can calculate pressure temperature uh, liquid hold of GOR over time is a one dimension, uh, is conceived as a one dimension, that means it converts faster, so it gives you a result a, a little bit quicker, uh, but also can be uh, converted in a 3D model if you use the HD model, the high definition model, but without compromising the speed calculation. 
It's a complete model which has five mass equations for all the bulk and dispersed phases. It has a three momentum equation for liquid, gas, and solid, and also one, one energy equation. It's a formula for a three phase fluid. That means they can handle oil, gas, and water all at the same time, as well as some of the solids that can be formed, such as wax and hydrate. It has the ability to simulate both slow transient, like it's logging, and also fast transient, like water hammer. And also, it has the ability to calculate or run any type of operation, such as digging operation. Now, I would like to start uh, to use the two cases that I have selected, but first I would like to discuss, disclose that these case studies are based on real studies, yet the values, the real values are not shown, and those cases are meant for illustration purpose only. The first case uh, is a 70 kilometer long 19 inch pipeline with gas condensate, which has some liquid accumulation uh, over the time. Then the peaking operation is required to sweep the liquid, yet we have a, a limitation factor, which is a, a surge capacity of 100 cubic meter at the end of the receiving facilities. Here we have uh, three uh, graphs. The first one to the left on the bottom is the pipeline bathymetry, so the, 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 the path of the pipeline. Then to the top of the right, we have the peak distance travel, and we can see that it's a 70 kilometer pipeline. And also we have the average velocity of each of the section volume. On the top, which is the most important one, is the search volume. And we have our constraint, which is 100 cubic meter. And if we surpass that limit, then it means that we're gonna flood our system and therefore tripping, tripping our facilities. We need to uh, optimize or design our peaking operation to avoid that extra volume. Since we didn't have any extra time to install a new catcher, a slow catcher, sorry, and uh, any new extra budget to create uh, another separator, we need to uh, do some parametric study in the turndown time and rate in order to slow the, the picking process, but without compromising or creating the possibility that the peak stall in any section of the pipeline. We're gonna also play, or we play as well, with the peak velocity by changing the leakage factor for reference, liquid factor is the amount of volume that bypassed the peak. And also we can have the possibility to, instead of running one peak, we can run trains of peaks and we need to decide whatever number of peaks and the insertion time of each one of these. In the preliminary study, we determined that the best configuration so far is gonna be a, a, a peak of strain of two peaks and uh, we need to further optimize the, the size of the peaks and the liquid factor of each of these peaks. And we have here the, the first preliminary result of the study, and we can see that the blue and, and black are corresponding to the first peak, and the green and red are corresponding to the second peak. The first peak was launched after one hour, and it, it was conceived as a 16-inch uh, diameter peak, and the second peak was launched after three hours with a diameter of 19, inch, uh, 19 inches. Uh, the rate turned down was 25% uh, before the peak, so we reduced the production of uh, the field by 25%. And the results at the beginning were uh, satisfactory for the first peak, but for the second peak, it was uh, surpassing our limitation. Therefore, we need to do a little bit more iteration to uh, not to reach that uh, limitation of 100 cubic meter uh, capacity. So. After several iterations, we come up with a final uh, operation sequence, which is uh, insert the first peak of 70-inch diameter and uh, reducing the production by 25% before launching the first peak, and then an, an addition 25% before launching the second peak, and uh, the same peak size for the second peak, and then the time will remain the same, meaning that one hour for the first peak and three hours for the second peak. And the result were uh, encouraging since uh, we reached uh, or we were below our limitation uh, capacity which was 100 cubic meter uh, for the liquid surge. So the main benefit for this particular study is that we were able to optimize peak uh, operations to avoid any floating receiving facilities without any, any, any investment or uh, in, uh, going to the field and test it and so on. And also, we avoid any installation of a new catcher or a slot catcher or any extra separator. The second study that we'd like to present to you is an 80 kilometer long 12-inch uh, pipeline with a waxy oil. And the picking was required to remove 
uh, any wax deposition that is in the pipe wall. But the main problem with this, uh, with this pipeline is that uh, the peaking operation was set up to run too frequently, uh, around every 15 days. So our first job was to determine if the 15 days uh, frequency was the correct one. By calculating the wax deposition of the pipeline, consider the correct condition meaning pressure, temperature, flow rate, and uh, characteristic of the fluid. So we, the first thing that we saw is that the 15-day timeline was too frequent to run the peak operation. And that means uh, higher non-productive time or more productive time uh, over the, uh, the period of time of the field. We determined that the right amount of the frequency was 25, uh, 27 days to run uh, the peak in this particular condition. And the second study that we did for this uh, particular study was to determine the efficiency and the time that would take after 27 days. Uh, obviously, we expected that the time was a little bit longer than before, since we were waiting a little bit more, therefore a little bit more difficult to remove any wax deposition. But the length or the length of the, uh, the peaking time was not very much uh, bigger than the previous one. And at the end, the whole uh, loss of production will notably reduce. So the main benefit for this particular study was determine the correct frequency for the peaking, reducing non-productive time, estimating the peaking efficiency for the run, uh, and also optimizing the production flow rate in order to, to produce or uh, produce the correct force to drive the peak and remove all the work deposition in the system. Now I'm uh, clearly approaching the end of my presentation, but before I would like to highlight a few things. The first is the capabilities of OGA uh, as, a, as a running uh, peaking operation. It's a very flexible and robust tool in order that, can hand, that can provide you the flexibility to model different peaking system configuration. You can insert different peaking options, such as different type of peaks, uh, different propellant fluid, different configuration of pipelines, uh, and different options as well that you can test it at the, uh, without any intervention in the field. It also helps to optimize the design of peaking variables when you already have uh, built facilities such as the flow rate, power capacity, velocity of the peak, arrival pressure, and so on. The second one is the benefit of using Olga for peaking. The first one, you can optimize peaking frequency, reducing non-productive time, also optimizing peak operation to reduce surge volume, meaning no extra, extra investment to a larger capacity. And also minimizing loss of production due to peaking operation, meaning reducing the time that you run each time you're peak. With that, I would like to thank you very much for your attention. Uh, now we're gonna move on to the Q&A session, but if for any case you would like to have further discussion, you can always contact me at the uh, email address here in this slide. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Andres, for this very interesting presentation. Uh, now we open the session uh, for um, questions. And uh, first, uh, uh, I would like uh, to pass this question. Uh, Andres, for, for long pipes, usually the risk of peak stalling is uh, it's a concern uh, from the team of operations. Uh, how do you see Olga as a tool, a predictive tool, uh, that could help uh, designing the, the PGN operations to provide confidence uh, to, this, uh, to these teams on, on the success of the procedure? Uh, from your personal experience, uh, how, how much confidence Olga can build on, on the predictions of, of the simulations and how accurate uh, the tool is in predicting the liquid surge, the, the peak uh, travel time, and all the other parameters that are important for the simulation. Yeah, thank you very much. Uh, so, Olga has been the industry lead in the multi phase flow and have been many, more than 25 years of uh, research. And the, 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 let's say, the precision of calculating the pressure drop, liquid surge, is between any 5% and 10% depends on the condition and how far those conditions are from any normal standard. But I think the most important factor that can determine um, the precision of the result or the confidence of the result will be the data that you input to the system. 
uh, we cannot expect any results that are, are confident if we don't have the data or uh, good data to, pro uh, to provide to the system. Uh, that's going to be the first thing, meaning good pressure reading, good characterization of the fluid, which is critical, uh, and recent data as well, because that's one of the challenges that we see in the in our sector, right? We we see PVT characterization from the 90s and the first time, and then operations never have the possibility to test it again because it's not, let's say, quote unquote, worth it. But uh, if we have those recent data, uh, that would definitely improve the certainty of our results. But I I can I can confidently say that Olga, when using the correct data, will give I from my experience I have a maximum result of pressure between 5% and 2% easily. Obviously, I cannot say that it's all the time, but most of the cases are within that range. Thank you, Andres. Another question uh, regarding the characterization of the peak. Uh, you were mentioning that typically we can retrieve uh, these key parameters uh, from the vendors. Uh, from your own experience, uh, are, is there any particular parameter from from those that you find uh, to be most critical or sensitive uh, for having a, an accurate uh, prediction of, of the peaking operations? Um, obviously, yeah, any push the peak and that create when you are pushing the peak are very critical. But in my experience, I think the most critical one, because it's the less certain, is the leakage factor. Sometimes the vendor can give you a specific leakage factor that are measured from their facilities, but when we go to the real life or the field, that might not be the real case, right? And that will be some uncertainty that we have during this type of process, and therefore, that's one of a critical value or the variable that I, I consider in my uh, study. Another aspect, uh, Andres, when, when designing, we always uh, need to be careful about both the minimum velocities to, to avoid stalling of the peak and the maximum velocity to, to, to preserve the integrity of the peak itself. Uh, do you see, uh, in particular, um, um, the, the development of, of the tool uh, helping the, the operators to design a proper range uh, of velocities for, for the peaking operation. Because in the past, I remember that it was uh, quite difficult, but now that we have all these process controls uh, functionalities in there, how do you see the, these improvements of, of, of the simulation to help in designing a, a, a more effective uh, velocity control of the peaking operation? Do you mean in real life, like an uh, online system? Uh, I, I mean, when, when designing in the simulator, and eventually, uh, hopefully, uh, that those uh, modeling uh, capabilities of, of Olga, uh, how do they translate into, into the uh, real operations in, in terms of, of uh, prediction capabilities? Yeah. So... Definitely, as I mentioned before, if we have the right data, uh, this approach to design a peaking program will give you um, definitely a confident result to implement to your system. And as you mentioned before, the peak velocity, the minimum and maximum, uh, is one of the key variables or the key, let's say, output that we get out from this system since, as you mentioned, it can be stalled in any part of a pipeline and also can be, uh, the integrity will be compromised if we go too fast. And therefore, we, we also create operational windows to, to see where it's going to be uh, the highest velocity and the lowest velocity of a peak uh, based on different conditions. Uh, and when we translate to this to the field or, or using this approach to help the field to run this operation, it's a definitely a plus. It will give you a bigger, a broader picture and at least give you a, fa a face envelope where you can run safely your uh, peak operation in case something happens. Uh, and with that in mind, you can also have the maximum minimum values that can you go for without any risk of your production, of your people, or your facilities. Thank you very much, Andres. 
Uh, with that, we close the Q&A session. I would like uh, to thank you very much, Andres, for, for your time and for this very interesting presentation. Uh, really appreciate it. Thank you very much for the attention and the invitation. Always welcome. For our next uh, presentation, uh, we are going to have uh, um, representatives from Baker Hughes uh, General Electric, Mr. Cesar Mauro, who co-authored this uh, presentation with Mr. Colin Nico. I understand that Cesar is going to be presenting today. Uh, he's a senior sales accountant manager for Baker Hughes within their subsea intervention ISM covering light well intervention scopes and services. With more than 14 years of experience in the industry, he delivers results for subsea technologies and service companies in North and South America. Uh, Cesar is going to be presenting to us today uh, a very interesting topic entitled Production Enhancement and Intervention Services. Uh, Cesar, uh, the virtual room is all yours. Hey, good, good morning, good afternoon, or good evening for the folks attending our presentation here. It's a pleasure to be here. Let me share my screen so we get this rolling. Um, uh, my name is today to talk a about uh, production enhancement and intervention services from the perspective of uh, a new world. So uh, our agenda will go talk a little bit about, uh, <clears throat> introduce myself, which I just did, talk about uh, integrated solutions, uh, the subsea services and well services, then we're gonna go into light well intervention, fluid intervention, and talk about uh, a few case studies. Then we go into questions. But um, the whole goal of, uh, as a company today has been to provide operators with uh, improve their recovery with the highest certainty at the lowest economic lift cost. That's the mission that uh, we're striving for, and the way that uh, we are going about that, it is what we're going to be talking about over here, and that adapts really well to this new world that we are living in. Uh, this is a journey that started uh, a while ago for Baker Hughes when uh, the legacy Baker Hughes merged with uh, GE Oil and Gas, and we got to see ourselves with uh, uh, a lot of different product lines on the surf side and uh, a lot of uh, equipment products that uh, did not uh, play together at that time. So this is the journey that we went through to get to it. and. What we are looking into providing to our customers is to improve their recovery, and we're going to talk about some of those tools that we're using to achieve that, some of the the tools that we're using to increase the certainty of it, and at the lowest economic lift cost. So this journey about uh, the merge of these two big companies was how can we all play together all these different products together and go about and serve our clients. So to improve uh, recovery, we are using a lot of the great uh, services that uh, Baker Hughes has. So with uh, oil at uh, $40, it's important that we analyze the screen and select the right wells to work with. So we've been approaching this in two different ways. One of them is more actively looking into publicly uh, disclosed information at the regulator uh, databases to take a look at the production trends or working with uh, operators to have access to some of uh, their data uh, then we move into screen, looking at those wells that are more aligned with the business uh, goals and select them 
based on the improvement potential or the extended life of that uh, field that we're looking to achieve. Uh, we can use other criteria like uh, location depending on how they are spread to maybe make a campaign a little bit more uh, manageable in terms of uh, geographic area. And, and how do we improve the certainty of our results? It's by working in an integrated manner. We have uh, teams that go from the geoscience, the geophysics teams, all the way to the folks on the operational side at the end of the vessel working the systems controlling the well or running tools downhole. We have a, an integrated workflow, which has been like a, a learning process for all of us. I mean, it's, it's a continuous uh, process. And because uh, Baker Hughes uh, works across the different uh, continents, um, every area we go, we, we, we might have to develop and adapt and adjust to the, to the local uh, workflows or the product lines as they are present there. In terms of uh, global infrastructure, that gives us like the backbone to be able to work in so many countries around the world. And how do we reduce or how do we get to the lowest economic lift cost to our clients? So we do work with uh, partners to bring in some of those that we do not have on our toolbox. And we also bring uh, them in to bring technologies that we have in our portfolio or outside partners that can bring some technology that can add value to what we're trying to achieve. Um, we're looking into productivity, so our teams are always striving to get um, the best uh, or uh, outcome possible. In terms of uh, lift cost, uh, it's it can be a mix of uh, outcome-based or commercial models that can be played around that. So. Um, we can perhaps uh, organize or plan a campaign based on some uh, production enhancement for some wells while doing the PNA to offset some of those costs. So it's the right combination of uh, wells or the well preparation of a campaign that will provide us with that lowest lift cost. And that's the formula that we are using and we've been testing and putting in place for quite some time. And as every time that we, we go on and about, we are making this model much better. And in this new world where oil is at uh, $40 and we have COVID, this all comes in as really welcoming uh, methods to achieve just that. So, but what does it take to do a well intervention or do some production enhancement on subsea wells? It typically takes the subsea services, which is everything that pretty much happens above the sea floor, including the well access and control. They're typically deployed from light well or fluid intervention systems and do not include those dry Christmas trees that are actually installed offshore. Then you have the well services that covers everything executed below the wellhead or downhole. They, those services include drilling completion, but more and foremost, the interventions part. They are typically deployed from coil tubing, wireline, slick line, drill pipe, or other variants. And then you need uh, the vessel. So those three elements together compose what you need to integrate onto, onto the back of a vessel to get that intervention going. And we have some of uh, 
Well, we have uh, some of that equipment to do the light well intervention, and, and those are our systems. Today, they account for 30% of the global large bore fleet. We have uh, systems ranging from 3 inch all the way up to 7 inch, and that are available globally for our cost. Um, one example of um, integration and uh, collaborative work, this is the work that we've done for for Shell, uh, for the Prelude project in Australia, where we work with uh, Saparok in China to deliver some uh, intervention where we use the Sapura vessel and a part of this tech. So we own half of it and they own the other half and they bring in the vessel plus all the other serves. So done down hold, they include like mechanical integrity or production type of uh, uh, services. And they can go from like a sand clean out all the way to some uh, sort of a stimulation that you can do using those systems. When deployed on riserless, you can run wire down, down hole or E-line, slick line. And when you are deploying some of those systems on the riser, which you are able to, tubing. Uh, either way, you have the ability to pump down those systems to be able to some stimulation, in this case, squeeze or something of that nature. Um, one of the most recent examples that I have to talk to you today is for a major operator here in the Gulf of Mexico, where they are going through a six well campaign. Actually, it's five well. We're doing two entries on one of the wells, and the idea was to run some uh, some. Uh, diagnostic tools and depending on results, do some uh, stimulation. This is the type of uh, live information that you can act on immediately. And this is a composition between uh, Baker Hughes, uh, C Innovations with um, today the, the back deck being provided by Holly Burton. And it's a collaboration between different companies that uh, should they bring to the final client the ability to have all the services on a standby or running rate only and don't have to manage each one of those services individually. So when one is down, everybody's down. So it's a new collaborative way to approach some of those projects. We have visibility of uh, some of the more work to come, and that's the, the, the reflex of a successful campaign so far. And this is what the back of the vessel of an integrated uh, offer would look like. You'd have your equipment uh, for the coil, for circulation, and all the other equipment that will go down a uh, hole. Uh, we also have... Um, Worked in uh, in in for Total in Nigeria for their ACPO field. It was a, a very interesting job where we deployed our system riserless and we did change some valves inside. The challenge of the logistics and getting everything worked there were uh, successfully accomplished due to our experience in dealing in West Africa. Uh, the client was very happy with the outcome. We have uh, other examples from the Gulf of Mexico for major operators. We're looking into filling some some days at the back end of a drilling campaign. They deployed one of our riser-based systems, deployed on drill pipe riser. The system uh, gave them the opportunity to do some lower abandonment at the back end of a campaign. Within 15 days, they lower this stack, which has less requirements and it's much more flexible and quick to deploy. And we're able to fill in those 15 days. Apart from the fact that uh, that uh, 
the BOP on that rig wasn't available due to maintenance, so they kept their schedule and kept working in spite of uh, the changes. Other type of integrated service that uh, can be put together in a, in, a, in a similar way to the lightweight interventions that are the fluid interventions services. That, that those services typically involve the combination of a fluid intervention system, a vessel, and a pressure pumping setup to be able to pump the fluids downhole. You typically use the fluid intervention services when you don't need to run wire or coil downhole and you need to just bull head. It has multiple technical applications and because of this system, like others, is fully agnostic, it can be hooked up to uh, any OEM tree. So this can be used for well stimulation, scale squeeze, well kill, or hydrate remediation. If you have trouble with your infrastructure and you need uh, to deal with pipeline, do some cleaning, you can tap into the a manifold or a plat as well. So Baker Hughes brings to the table not just the access method, which is the stack I'm going to show in a second, but also the pressure pumping and the chemicals, and all wrapped up with uh, that uh, fine work of selecting the right wells to obtain the right returns. So this is uh, our 10K system to exemplify how the systems look like. They can either be deployed uh, and sit on a mud mat next to the Christmas tree or the access point that you're reaching out, or can be deployed to sit on top of the tree. The, this is a good visualization of uh, the setup for a fluid intervention campaign where you uh, over here, we have a case study for Tulo Oil, where they were looking into doing some fluid stimulation. And and you typically will have the vessel, the conduits that can be coils, can be hoses, or even uh, some uh, uh, composite pipes, which has also a flexible uh, section connected to that subsea safety module, which will then have a jumper connected to the tree. Um, in this uh, campaign over here, we worked with uh, a third party supplier to utilize a, a subsea safety module. Uh, as of that time, uh, we didn't have our, our system available. So in the back of the vessel, you will also have like all the chemicals stored and all the pumps to push that, uh, those chemicals through those lines. So the production gain on this specific uh, job was so high that uh, they have been repeating these activities yearly uh, for quite some time. Um, I, I opened uh, the time for for questions, it's been uh, a lot of ground to cover in and, and so few minutes that uh, I'll be glad to answer anybody's questions. Thank you very much, uh, Cesar. I have a couple of questions in here. Let's start uh, uh, from, from this one. Um, uh, how cost, uh, customizable are these integrated services? Is uh, is Baker Hughes able to provide a service to company where uh, perhaps uh, we we can select uh, certain pieces of, of of the service because probably we have it uh, already in inside the, the company or or through uh, another commercial agreement. Uh, can you be embedded in the operator's office? This model, uh, how flexible uh, can be? All right. So l let me address this question in a few topics. So we are very flexible. So we, uh, Baker Hughes, have 
put together a team that is cross-functional and that has as its main goal to deliver what's best for our customers at the lowest economic cost. So what we can, what we have been doing to achieve that is we have been looking not just internally for solutions or products that can be used on those interventions, but also to the external market to see if there is new technologies or new methods to uh, process to be used. In addition to that, we understand that um, a lot of the operators, they have uh, preferences for process or equipment or even companies. So we are very flexible to work with, uh, with the customer on any of their previously engaged uh, companies or business or tools. So we are very open to look beyond the fall of the product lines. We understand that uh, every single product line inside Baker wants to sell their products, but sometimes it might not be the right combination. And this group is making sure that uh, we can veto and justify the choices that we make in front of our customers. Generally speaking, uh, in, in, in terms of advantages, qualitatively speaking, uh, the, the, the integrated service, uh, how, how effective and attractive do you see it uh, as a proposal instead of these uh, separate pieces of the puzzle for the client? Qualitatively speaking, in, in terms of, of cost, time, seamless uh, interfaces, uh, where do you see that uh, value proposition uh, of the integrated uh, uh, services? So um, there's different ways to, to recognize the value for the customer over here. Some clients are, they just don't have the, the time or the resources to manage all these different uh, services and products that need to be put together to deliver uh, an integrated solution. That might be one of the proposals. Another one is the client uh, has some assets, but uh, doesn't also have the resources to evaluate uh, how to best approach the problem. So let's say they have a combination of uh, wells that need some stimulation and PNAs that they need. How can we combine those two activities to perhaps finance the PNA activity that you need to go? Or perhaps can we wrap this campaign in an outcome-based type of arrangement where the client uh, pays it later? That might be another set of values. So it, it will depend. So we understand that uh, for for the majors, um, in spite of having a lot of resources in the house, they are going out to the market and looking for uh, OEM or service company uh, solutions, uh, not just the way that they have been doing. We see that uh, globally. Uh, we always see also some of those silos that were in place because of the market conditions kind of changing. And also the market conditions also open space for um, different approach to to the same uh, thing. So things that uh, you were not considering or looking into before because the the you had a, a rig available or now you may be able to consider it back and the contrary as well. So things that you couldn't do rig less and can be now achieved. So different ways to approach the, the value proposition question. But in general, there is something for everyone from the independent 
the majors. Thank you. Um, regarding the light well interventions, uh, in, in the old times, any time that we had to perform an intervention, uh, it was always a concern because you needed uh, to bring the rig, and that meant uh, significant uh, cost implications. With uh, now these uh, uh, light intervention solutions that uh, are in, in the market, qualitatively speaking, uh, how large is, is, the, is the piece of the market that the light will uh, well interventions has taken uh, displacing the rig, qualitatively speaking. So there is. Uh, so we 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 work in a in a very conservative uh, market, and people try to do what they have been doing for quite some time, and and rigs are not going to go away, and and people keep using rigs for a lot of things and especially for the backup plans in case something goes wrong and, and, and having the right uh, tools at the moment that uh, you do something wrong, it, it's very important. But at the same time that I say that uh, operators, independent and majors, have been using light well intervention, riseless mode for quite some time. And we still call it unconventional, but it's just as conventional as using a rig. So we see a lot of space for, for in the market for the use of that. It's just uh, how we uh, how some of those services may be perceived. So y you can actually do a lot using light well. And light well not just means going riserless. You can deploy a system like this on a rig with the combination of a rig or a Class B vessel, and also optimize your campaign. So there's plenty of space, and qualitatively, I would say that uh, we've uh, we've gained a a lot of uh, space in the market and. Dollar, uh, the oil at uh, forty dollars, it uh, I think it strengthens even more this market. And uh, regarding uh, the type of, of uh, interventions uh, with the light well operations, uh, do you see any particular trend of dominant operations that? Uh, uh, Operators uh, show more appetite uh, for to perform uh, with light intervention services. Yes, we we well there is a, there's a little bit of everything, but I'd say that um, some of the ones that uh, we've been seeing a lot have to do with running uh, diagnostic tools downhole and with that data uh, go ahead and do some uh, production enhancement, some stimulation on that well. That's one. Other one is the replacement of uh, downhole uh, valves, as well as some uh, some other mechanical work that uh, could, uh, let's say, open another zone and, and shift sleeves and things of uh, that nature. So those are the ones that uh, catch more of my attention these days. Okay, thank you very much. Uh, with that question, uh, we close our Q&A session of this uh, very interesting topic. Uh, Cesar, thank you, thank you very much uh, for delivering this uh, uh, interesting subject uh, to the open days. Very much appreciated your contribution and your openness uh, uh, to show us uh, these uh, seamless uh, services from Baker Hughes. Thanks a lot. Thank you. Have a great day. You too. Now we are going to move to the third presentation of the afternoon. Uh, in this case, uh, our presenter is going to be Mr. Jose Pina uh, from Schlumberger. Uh, Jose uh, started his career 13 years ago in Schlumberger 
uh, as an R&D reservoir engineer in Faja Center of Excellence in Venezuela. Uh, Jose has uh, held various roles in Schlumberger, from R&D, uh, reservoir engineering consultant, business development, and technical marketing, among others. Currently, Jose is based in London, in the headquarters of Schlumberger, in there, where one of his main objectives is to align the different technologies and product lines through a very integrated view of the engineering and operations of the oil and gas industry. Jose will be delivering today to us a presentation entitled Integrated Field Development Planning, Linking Modeling, Simulation, and Planning. Uh, Jose, welcome. Uh, the stage is yours. Jose, I think you are mute. Okay, now you can hear me? Now we can hear you. Perfect. Thank you very much for the introduction, um, and, and thanks so much for the opportunity. Um, today I'm going to talk about something that is a, quite of an interesting topic, and we've been working a lot, is integrated field development planning, which we're trying to find out different ways to uh, how to tackle a better field development plan, how to make it more consistent, more reliable. So one thing that we have found in the industry, and that has been a lot of the of the work that I'm sorry about here, is um, it's um, around some of the challenges that we have found in the industry. Um, sorry again, it's it's it's. Hold on a second. Let me just put myself on on. No, do not disturb. Okay. Um, some of the challenges that we have found or we have seen in the industry. Is, is there are so many different things right that that affect the field development plan well, one of the key things is about you know first of all the real understanding of the reservoir when we talk about you know from a from a dynamics perspective when it comes to understanding pressure distribution how fluids are distributed and all this kind of stuff that's one of the key things that very affect uh field development plan when it's in its early stage especially on you know when we're running simulations Another second, and I would say the, one of the biggest one is the geological uncertainty, which affects directly how, you know, basically what are the different possibility, what are the possible outcomes that we can expect from that particular asset. Um, that is one of the biggest ones. And another one, which is kind of like I think what the industry is trying to align and trying to find is around integration. How can we stop working in silos and instead not only from a just software, but also from all kind of different solutions. How can we integrate all the different uh, systems together, right? That is uh, that is uh, the, what I consider was the third one. So for this presentation, I'm going to be running uh, through a sort of a demo or example, which we're, I'm going to try to tackle each of these uh, aspects. And one of them, we're going to try to talk about a short-term production optimization uh, the second one will be around different field development strategies, more on a mid-term type of um, development strategy. And then we're going to close with more of a, an example of how can we just uh, close uh, the whole loop by integrating all the systems together. So the example I'm going to talk about is actually this is a real example from South America where we can see a top view of the reservoir, quite complex we can see the colors indicating the different fluids. So we have red, blue, and, and green, of course, gas, oil, and water. And then we can see that um, vertically, we can see that the fluid distribution is not quite simple, right? It's a very compartmentalized reservoir from a stratigraphic point of view, very complex, lots of shales intercalated. And we can see this uh, section of the well, for example, where we have water and oil and even gas at some point, even water and gas at some point. Um, so trying to complete those wells becomes quite of a challenge, right? It, it becomes a really, uh, and that's the most immediate um, type of a strategy in the field development planning, especially let's say right now with the oil price situation, although it's getting a bit recovered, still companies, that the, the, the main preference is to go for short-term type of, um, of uh, strategies, right? So where can we recomplete the wells where we can re-perforate? 
So in a scenario like this, it becomes extremely difficult to kind of uh, come up with uh, what could be the best strategy, right? So a lot of measurements are needed and a lot of planning and a lot of uh, calculations are needed. So what we're doing right now and we're working pretty close with our segments, uh, their completion segments, is that we're running simulations now where we integrate all the sim all the geo model and all the dynamics, the wellboard dynamics. And instead of running multiple completion scenarios, what we do is just we actually let the simulator, in this case, intersect uh, to optimize the simulation, or the op optimize the completion as the simulation runs. So that allows us to have like on the fly optimization process that instead of running thousands of cases to try to find what are the best configurations, well, we just run um, just one simulation in which now the simulator is trying to capture even in hours, uh, like to, to the, the time scale, like we can take it down to hours, we can start seeing how can we operate those, um, let's say flow control valves or completion devices that will optimize production or will reduce, let's say, water production or will reduce uh, gas production. So we can see this is uh, within Petrel environment and Petrel uh, platform. Um, one of the options we have advanced complete optimization where we can add the wells and we can define the different strategies that we want to use. And as I say, it's a linear optimizer that is running within the simulation. So what basically is the idea is to look for different possible completion scenarios where these valves are changing or these valves might be operating differently, we can say in terms of weeks, months, or even hours, if you wanna take it down to hours. So we have tested this against actual field um, test or around field experience, and it has worked beautifully. And we've been able to really capture the physics, what's happening uh, around those flow control valves and how can we operate them pretty much in real time? So a well that is very um, well uh, instrumented with all the DTS, with all pressure gauges and temperature gauges, we can really feed back into the simulator and try to come up with a better strategy on in terms of completion. Another strategy, which is very common in these in this days as well, is in field drilling. Uh, not In some cases, it might be massive in field drilling strategies, other cases, um, more a more, uh, slow, or I would say, um, minimize the amount of wells. And, and, and companies are trying to find out um, how many wells should I drill and where should I drill them. So one methodology that we have prepared, and I worked on this project last year, and still I'm working on, on, on some more details to try to improve this, is how can we basically start moving wells around and as we move wells around, just to try to find what would be the best well location, we're also changing the actual geological realization. So now I'm taking into consideration, as you remember, the second point of that um, of those challenges was the geological risk. So now I'm taking into consideration the geological risk um, as part of my in-field drilling um, campaign. So we can see, for example, how I'm looking into different positions uh, of the well can be placed, uh, considering, of course, all the anti-collision and, and existing wells, and then try to kind of come up with a map. And this is basically um, what I'm trying to get is basically I'm um, poking wells uh, uh, across a whole reservoir, and then we're trying to come up with a map that represents production or, uh, or cumulative oil production for the whole model, right? So this is telling me that, for example, this red area we can see here, these are the areas with higher pr production that we found when we simulate those wells in this particular point. But also we, pr we simulated across different realization, geological realizations. So this is telling me the high probable areas where I'm gonna produce more oil. Now, this is very powerful because it, it is very normal that using just one model, let's say your P50, and you try to run an in-field drilling strategy, you end up like probably once you actually actually drill the well, produce the well, is not producing as much as you were expecting. Um, now with this methodology, we are able to very like define where we have um, the most of uh, or the highest chances to produce most of the oil. 
So that way we can rank different areas in the reservoir. So we can see the red one indicates the highest chances to produce more oil. We have like a bluish kind of, um, and there is another area here that is not very, you cannot very look at it because the scale, the color scale, but there is a second area here that is not that great. And the third area, which will be more like this, it's not, it's the worst one. So this is already telling me, you know, do not even look at any other places when it, when it comes to infield drilling, look at this area because here I already try all different locations. I optimize the well completion as I'm poking wells. And at the same time, I run this through different realizations, which I already am taking into account the geological risk. So this is very powerful and very, very powerful information uh, to use and, and, and uh, for our infield drilling strategy. Now, the second part will be more around evaluating midterm type of projects or uh, field development. And for this, um, we're going to use, I'm going to start talking about a, an application called FD Plan, which is part of our Delphi cognitive environment. And in here, basically, planning engineers can define the different scenarios and the different um, type of of uh, yeah scenarios that they 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 want reservoir engineers to look at now here um pretty much um hello can you hear me just just to confirm that i'm able to that i'm still hearing you guys hello yes we can hear you <laughs> Can you hear me? Yes. Yes, we can. Okay. Because I can I cannot hear you for some reason. We hear you perfectly. Let me just uh... Hello? Yes, we can hear you perfect. No, I can speak. If you guys can hear me, I'll continue then, okay? okay. So, um, so, so we have different, uh, different analysis that is done in the FD plan, um, in which, uh, you know, there's different constraints taken into account by the planning engineers where, you know, we have the constraints, how many rigs, uh, how many rigs available and all that kind of stuff that will constrain at the end our scenario. So me as a reservoir engineer, I can say, yeah, we can drill 20 wells. Maybe those 20 wells cannot be drilled in one year. Maybe we just have availability only for maybe four uh, four wells or five wells because the rig availability. So all that is constrained uh, within the FD plan. And from here, the planning engineers request um, the, um, the, the different scenarios and then Pretty much the reservoir, the reservoir engineer can access to the petrol project corresponding to that particular asset from FD plan. So it all happening in the cloud opens our petrol project. And from here, we can start also working on de risking the model from a geological point of view. So try to assess their geological risk. And at the same time, take into consideration all the possible um, um, uncertainties. Now we run all these cases in a very automated way with from Petrel that goes in the cloud again, running intersect or eclipse in the cloud. In this case, it, it was in intersect, so all, everything running in the cloud, and then that takes us to uh, another application called Reservoir Engineer Workspace, in which we can ver uh, we can analyze all the data related to that particular set of simulations. So now we're not looking at one case at a time, or maybe 10 cases, we're looking at an ensemble of cases, which it can be hundreds, it can be thousands of models, right? And this application already workspace allows us to do the analysis of all the different um, scenarios and understand which one has more risk, which one has less risk. So in this case, we're analyzing three different scenarios, one of the midterm, which is more like water injection, gas injection, and do nothing and then we can see the different effects of each of them. Then we can analyze and, and in a more uh, statistical way as well. Uh, for example, P10, P50, P90, um, in terms of cumulative oil production also rate. 
And the good thing about this is that once we get here, also we can understand and analyze our uncertainty itself. So all these, these are all the different components or variables that we're trying to, to um, change or we're trying to analyze and understand. And then the good thing here is that here we can advise to that um, to FD plan which cases are the ones that you should take it into account in order to do the analysis. So in FD plan, all the economic analysis will be done, all the risk analysis will be done in terms of, um, you know, what is available in terms of constraints, facilities constraints, risk constraints, and all this kind of stuff. And that will go straight to them in a very automated way. So that makes it easy uh, the way we're integrating data across multiple domains that makes it easy how we're sharing the information to um, with uh, with the rest of, with uh, with the planning engineers, and at the same time, I think a very powerful thing is that now we're including more and more uh, the geology part into this. So that makes all the geomodelers, geologists, be get more closer to the actual field development planning itself. And so it's they're very close more to the decision making of of the different scenarios to implement. So just to um, the last point, it's around uh, integrated planning. Uh, and in this case, uh, it's around integrated simulation. So basically now what we're gonna talk and what we're gonna look at is how can we put all the systems together and we can, and how much can we actually consider, um, you know, in terms of, of forecasting. So now we got to the point that we can not only simulate very well our reservoir, the well bore, all the well were going up in terms of um, of uh, artificialist systems, but also the actual network itself and the facilities. And recently, we've been able to incorporate all the processing facilities, so things like upgraders, um, flow uh, flow stations, and dehydration stations, and everything that happens at the very end of the process also can be taken into account. So all the different facilities, as you know, as as there really are can be taken into account. So for that, we're using a software call that has been in the market already for some time, integrated asset modeling or IAM. And in here, we basically can incorporate all the different um, applications in one single environment. So we can see that we have our petrol project and we have our pipes in project. And, and then, um, sorry, um, and then, sorry about that. And then here we can incorporate our pipeline project, which allows us to have all the different uh, surface facilities, but also we can have our symmetry project, which incorporates all the processing facilities. So now we have a chance to not only do different multiple realizations from a geological point of view, but also we can, we can attach to that all the different components along the production system. So we can have all the artificial lift modeling done in, in pipeline, we can have all the surface facilities and and put all that together in one massive model that it can provide to the to, it will provide to the um, to the planning engineers um, a very good view a very integrated view of what's happening and what are the outcomes that we might expect so the economic analysis that we're going to build we're going to uh, we're going to get are going to be stronger and going to be more confident and these are the type of analysis and then results that we can get from different scenarios that we can try, all that connected to a whole huge one happy model, we can say. And um, and at the same time, um, um, everything uh, in very well connected across the different, the different applications. So the, the RE role in the FDP evaluation becomes a becomes a more critical, and I would say more than just RE, also the, geo, the geoscientist as well. So if we look at geos, uh, RE and, and GNG and RE, now becomes more of a more powerful um, role because not only, for example, with FD plan or the planning engineers, not only they, I mean, they frame the, the, the what are the possible scenarios, and once it gets to the evaluation stage. Now, reservoir engineers and geologists, um, we can work all together to produce a, ser a series of different realizations, which will be translated into a better understanding what's happening in the reservoir by, you know, managing and understanding the different scenarios, performing analytics to all the results, and then try to understand where to place new wells, for example. 
So with that, um, uh, with that, we'll we'll, we'll bring more um, and better decisions uh, to the field development plan. So what we have found is a speed up of 300 times more in terms of simulation. We ensure profitability of the project, and of course, we improve production by 10% for this specific case that we've been running um, just by finding bottlenecks along the system. So that's all that I have for this presentation, and thank you very much. And if you have any questions, please um, go ahead. I'm not able to hear anyone, even background noise, but I'm, I'm, I hope that you guys are listening. Jose, we are listening perfectly. Mm -hmm. uh, if you cannot... Maybe, uh, I you, you'll have to... Yeah, I, 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 yeah, I think that would be the question that I write to them. That okay. better. Um, yeah, here, anything. Um, so the first question I see here, for instance, say how much gain in computational efficiency are attained comparing to legacy software to allow these sophisticated workflows? Um, also, when the software optimizes completion by itself, it is for each well, or can we reach a certain level of standardization of completion? A few, 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 few for the field instead. Yeah. Okay. So let me go one by one. Um, okay. The computational efficiency. Well, it's 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 very compared to legacy software. Let's say Eclipse, and we have seen also with other other software in the market. We have seen that Interstat has quite of a an improved uh, performance, and it was meant to be like that. It was it was uh, was built from the very beginning to be a high performance type of, of simulator. Um, just to give you an idea, I run and I've been working on the same case. I run around um, a thousand simulations within a day, right? So let's say uh, something that in my machine with eight cores, I was taking four hours. Uh, something with thirty two cores. Um, now is running in five minutes, for example, in Intersect. Um, just to kind of give you the, the, an idea of, of that. What I found, me, my, myself as a consultant, I found that uh, I've been able to run thousands of cases within a day now. And uh, especially having access to a cloud, of course. But having now models are, it were, they were running in five, six hours, which was my normal time. Now they're running in 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 something like um, like five minutes, so that's that's huge improvement. Now I can run, you know, within five minutes. I have one model within an hour. We'll get lots of them. Now for the completion, so the software the software and, and Intersect he uses, and one of the things good things that Intersect has is that it works. Um, it, it's very flexible in terms of extensibility. Like it, it works with Python, so. Um, it's very extensible, and and that allows us to create all these type of optimization routines, um, and 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 you can ver you can go well by well if you want, or you can have a whole set of wells that you want to optimize other simulations running. So you can have it, you know, it's very flexible. You can have it, you know, here you just want to understand one well at a time, or if you just want to go for the whole field and then optimize all the wells in the field. Uh, or certain wells in the field, um, yeah, um, so that can be done. Um, so it's very flexible. The second question was around FD plan. How on earth is the implementation effort? Uh, and what is the degree of maturity? A couple of years ago, it was in beta trial. Can we share already some successful stories of deployment? Yes. So it is very, it is very mature now. There is some case studies already that were presented in our forum last year um, and it's in our web page. So you're going to see companies like names like Woodside, names of all the companies in South America, and Petronas, I think also they've been already using this. Um, the level of maturity, I think at this point is very mature now. I think what we were wa waiting for FD plan to be mature enough is that the different applications that surround uh, FD plan has to reach a certain level of maturity as well. And now we got to that level. So let's say the RA workspace is one of them where reservoir engineers will start running cases, but there, if there's no RA workspace, it becomes a bit, a bit like difficult to share those results with FD plan. Now it becomes very automated. It's something that 
basically the FD plan or the engineer plan engineer requests the case, goes to the reservoir engineer automatically. I know which case I need to start working on. I can run my simulations super quick, so I can get results very fast. And then I can within the same system, I can recommend to uh, the plan engineer. These are the these are the simulations that you should take into account. And once it goes to them, automatically the system will recalculate everything, and it basically will tell you, well, this is your, how your economics looks like. This is how the the different KPOs and KPIs that you have set in FD plan they're going to look like with the new with the new um, with the new uh, scenarios. So it's um, that the idea is that to promote easy collaboration, automation, and 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 um, and that is and that is there. And I have one more question around FD plan. Uh, deal with third parties. Can we include outcomes from uh, um, at some extent? Yes. Um, it's 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 all about uh, what type of data you're trying to share. Um, we have APIs are open. Um, and you can pretty much, and companies um, like the companies that I mentioned already, would sign, and I think Petronas as well. Uh, they they've been trying to use uh, other products that are not Slumberjay products to plug in, and 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 and, and try to run uh, other stuff, and then collaborate the data or share the data that is produced from one product to another. Uh, now it has its challenges. Um, I'm I'm not sure. It depends. Again, it depends on the application. But we have successfully done that, and it, it's it's um at once it's once it's kind of the, the, and that's I think what's the beauty of all this Delphi philosophy is that what once it's within the the ecosystem, then the FD plan can see it, then the RA workspace can see it, then somebody that is running everything in the cloud um can see it. Typical time of uh, for implementation. Well, it depends. It depends on the size of the project. I have seen projects that are like couple of months to projects that has been years because the companies are looking more of a corporate type of implementation rather than just a, a planning type, very specific to an asset. Um, but it, it can go from a couple of months to two years. And now with the maturity level that we have, with the level of maturity that we have in the product, I think it should be quite quick and it should be um, very, very, very quick turnaround time. So as I said, running all this, we pretty much we're producing right now a new set of results for the same project that I show, and it's taking less than than a week just to get a thousand simulations ready, and then share that to, to the um, planning engineer with the planning engineers. So it all it all depends, right, uh, of the size of the project and what you're trying to get to, but definitely this is changing a little bit the way we're doing reservoir engineering, especially simulation engineering. Um, so I don't know if there is any other question. Unfortunately, I cannot hear anything, Jorge, so I'm sorry for that. <laughs> no worries. No worries. That happens all the time. I believe oh, that there was it. one no last question. question. Yeah. Um, do you provide it as a service or as a product? Well, it's, it's, it's a product as a service, right? So it's, it's, uh, it's in the cloud, so it's... It's a product running in the cloud, but if you want to have a specific service around it in terms of implementation and even in around domain expertise, it also can be provided, yeah. I think that was the last, last, last question. So I think, um, yeah, Jorge, so I don't know if, if you have any other questions. Uh, that was the last question that we had. Uh, I hope that our team can uh, pass that information to Jose. I would like uh, to thank uh, Jose for his very interesting presentation. Uh, thank you very much, Jose. Sadly, you cannot listen to us. Uh, uh, very much appreciated uh, your contribution and participation in this seventh uh, open days uh, in the production assurance uh, session. Uh, indeed, uh, very much appreciated. Thanks, Jose. With that, uh, we close the third presentation of this uh, afternoon's session, and uh, hopefully we can now move 
for the fourth uh, presentation of the afternoon. Uh, in this case, uh, the presenters uh, are from Schlumberger, uh, Mr. Michel Mansuli and Mr. Nicolas Roski. I hope I pronounced it uh, correctly. Uh, Michel and Nicolas uh, will be presenting uh, a very nice topic about a, a new product, a new solution offered by Schlumberger. Uh, it's called Symmetry. And they're going to be presenting Symmetry, the new process engineering software, case studies in cross-discipline evaluations involving reservoir production facilities. Michel is the process engineering software. He's the sales lead uh, for Europe and Africa. He has over 20 years uh, of experience in bringing engineering solutions for the industry using process simulation, working experience at process simulation providers and engineering companies. On the other hand, Nicolas is a process engineer with more than 20 years experience shared between process and safety simulation engines for the industry. He has experience working with engineering companies, natural gas stockage and transport companies, as well as process simulation providers. Michelle, Nicholas, uh, the room is all yours. Thank you. Uh, can you just confirm you? you see the, the screen? Indeed, we see the screen. Okay, so I guess that, uh, okay thank you. So, uh, good afternoon to everybody, and thanks for uh, attending the, the session today with us. So I will start to um, make an introduction on, uh, on the Symmetry technology, which is the new solution, a process facility engineering solution proposed by Schlumberger. I will, we will then, uh, well, briefly give you an overview of uh, a solution, uh, a project that was uh, made uh, using piping and, and, and Symmetry. And finally, my colleague, uh, So, symmetry, so symmetry is, uh, is part of uh, the Schlumberger Petro Technical Suite, and um, symmetry is completing uh, the Schlumberger Petro Technical Suite by uh, adding capability to the user to model process facilities and extend the modeling capability outside of the subsurface area. I think, uh, well, you know that Schlumberger has a quite extensive solution uh, regarding pipe, uh, pipe seam, Olga, Eclipse, and uh, reservoir engineering. So Schlumberger, with the addition of, uh, of the symmetry solution, is now able with the uh, Petrotechnical Suite to offer an engineering and modeling uh, solution for their oil and gas uh, uh, customer covering the entire hydrocarbon chain. So we, we start from the port to the, to the process facility through the extraction, gathering, and separation process and systems. Um, just for your information also, so uh, Symmetry as a part of the Petrotechnical Technical Suite is available on-prem uh, as an on-prem software, but it's also available under Delphi, under our Cognitive ENP environment through a different domain profile. Uh, through these two di different domain profile, you can uh, access uh, FlareSim, PipeSim, Olga, and Symmetry. Maybe I will activate my laser pointer, so here. So Symmetry as a, a process simulator, in fact, can cover from the production, so the extraction of uh, the oil and gas uh, through the gathering system. It can cover the processing part by transforming once the oil and gas is reaching the facilities so to transfer the product to a more valuable product to be uh, sell to the consumer and even to uh, do some modeling in the downstream area. So symmetry cover from 
production, midstream, and downstream. As any process simulator, so the basic part, uh, the basis of uh, symmetry is uh, the thermodynamics, and the, uh, we have various all characterization methods available uh, inside of uh, symmetry from the classical one uh, that uh, is most used. And we have also some specific particular methods that are, uh, I would say, unique inside of symmetry. Um, we also cover through uh, our solution around flare and uh, safety system. So we have also the possibility to do uh, flare system analysis and take care about uh, our studies. In all this area, we have two kind of engines that are available. Uh, we have a steady state engine and a dynamic engine. So uh, steady state analysis and dynamics analysis can be done with uh, the, 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 the process uh, platform. We have, of course, uh, productivity tools like, you know, the parametric study, optimizer, regression study to link with, uh, to do some uh, mix and uh, the, the fluid characterization. And of course, uh, once you get all that kind of tool, we start to think about uh, digital twins and, and, uh, and the application. So uh, Symmetry can connect to historians, to OPC. It can uh, so be used in web and cloud and uh, is, of course, uh, one of the, the, the basic bricks that can be used for machine learning uh, systems. So after giving you so a brief overview of what is Symmetry and what do we mean by this new solution, we will, uh, I will just uh, speak to you about a project that was done uh, last year in, uh, in, in Latin America uh, involving pipe seam and symmetry. So to show you the complementary of the solution. So in this, uh, so in this project, uh, we were studying a field producing heavy oil with high water cut. And uh, the objective and the main uh, objective of the study was to, to validate uh, possible dilution scenarios with uh, a light, a light ends uh, blending, for example. We looked at production to operational change. believe that we have lost for a moment communication. So let's work develop this case considering different water production, pump efficiencies and different operational operational conditions. But also a good uh, exercise for the operational team to uh, troubleshoot uh, some uh, part of their plant where they had uh, inconsistent measuring and uh, to see where they had to recalibrate their uh, measurements or to uh, what we call uh, trying to do virtual metering or trying to get an idea of some parameters that are not measured in the system. So in this solution, pipe seam was used in conjunction with symmetry. So pipe seam uh, is uh, inside of Schlumberger, uh, our um, multi-phase Simulator, simulator for flow assurance, but it has a very interesting part in uh, at the level of uh, well modeling. So in this project, the 13 wells that were involved in the project were modeled with pipe sim. So there was a detailed study from uh, the bottom hole of the, of the, of the well until the, the well head with uh, the, the centrifugal pump. So they, they were, they, this system was fully studied to uh, quantify the production profile curve. So in fact, um, this uh, study of the 30 wells produces what we call the wellhead uh, curve that is that will be used by symmetry. So this was the input that were given uh, to, to do the, the hydraulic study on the system. 
So for for each of the of the of the well we we study so the production process with four different water cuts through a pressure node analysis. Okay. So the I would say that was the input of the analysis in, in pipe seam and the output was an input for symmetry uh, in terms of uh, the modeling of symmetry. So inside of symmetry, what we have developed is uh, an hydraulic network model of the system. So where you have the production of the oil at the different uh, wells and through the network. And so the symmetry pipe uh, workspace was used to build this hydraulic model of the, pipe, of the, the gathering pipeline network. And uh, we use symmetry also because in this case, the, the, the fluid that was going through the system was a heavy oil. And uh, symmetry has a rigorous and a very good fluid characterization engine. Um, here in this case, uh, what you see in the slide is called a PNA method that was used to properly model the heavy holes produced by the well. Of course, this was based on the data available from the hole operator, and this is just a screenshot of what uh, you see inside of Symmetry, how we did uh, the characterization. So we use uh, some thermal methods to characterize uh, the fluid properly and have a good prediction on the viscosity, on the pressure drops, and, and so on, on the effort doing a proper uh, hydraulic calculation. So once the hydraulic uh, symmetry model was calibrated against uh, historical data, uh, we did several uh, parametric studies. So once you have the model ready, what you do is that you start to uh, move the system uh, outside of normal operation and you start to, to see the relationship if I increase that kind of uh, parameter uh, what will be the effect on the production. So what has been studied, for example, um, I put here like uh, four or five uh, uh, variation. We, we study the, the, wa the water cut change. We, we study also the, the fluid temperature profile that will influence, of course, the, the wax formation. Um, there was also a scenario where the operator would wanted to introduce two, two new wells and he wanted to show or to see how this will affect the production. Also in case of blending a light crude because it was a heavy oil, so uh, to get it floating with the flow assurance uh, constraint, uh, maybe the, the light ends was uh, also an alternative. And uh, there was one uh, last example, which was the um, well pump frequency increase. And, all these scenarios, what we can say is that uh, there they had been several recommendations that was done uh, through the operator, and the well pump frequency is the, on, on three wells was the, the major recommendation that had uh, the more, I would say, financial impact on the production of the oil because it could increase the uh, the, the oil by uh, 500 barrel uh, oil per, per day. So, well, if, you, if we are able to maintain that during the whole year, that's a potential width of uh, 5 million per year. But of course, you need to be aware that if, as, as there was a quite high production of water from the well, if we increase that, we need also to, uh, well, be able to, manage and treat all this water that will come out with the extra uh, oil that will be coming, okay? So this is just to, to end up to say that this integrated model approach uh, using pipe team and symmetry solution inside of the Schlumberger technical, uh, petrotechnical suite uh, has make possible to support the operator, uh, the old operator engineer in, in validate their operational conditions and to uh, identify or help them to identify improvement opportunity or, or production potential and try to uh, make, I would say, uh, 
uh, various scenarios and trying to make somehow visible what might be invisible or difficult to quantify at some point. So I will uh, now give the hand to my colleague Michele, who will uh, uh, speak to you about um, a cross-discipline offering on uh, carbon capture. Michele? Yes. Uh, so can, can you see my screen? I'm sharing yes, we can. See your screen. OK, perfect. So uh, now, basically, uh, we are, uh, I will dedicate the last uh, five to 10 minutes of the presentation to talk more about uh, an offering. So until now, Nicola has been talking about a project that we delivered uh, uh, actually during the last, uh, in 2019, and the final delivery was at the beginning of 2020. Uh, with, uh, let's say, a cross, uh, um, cross implementation of pipe sim and, uh, and, uh, and symmetry. Now what I will talk is instead an offering, you know, uh, and this is the offering that Schlumberger is, has put together uh, in terms of technology and services uh, for uh, everything that goes under the name of uh, carbon capture, uh, utiliz utilization and storage, you no? Um, Schlumberger has been, is quite well positioned uh, in, uh, in terms of, uh, uh, I would say, offering uh, um, technology, modeling technology for every aspect uh, of the uh, uh, CCUS, uh, carbon capture, uh, utilization and storage uh, supply chain. So going from uh, uh, the sources, the CO2 sources, uh, uh, methodology of capture, uh, transport, uh, either by pipeline uh, or by, by ship, compression systems in order to inject uh, your CO2 uh, back into the reservoir, well modeling, and then finally uh, the, the path related uh, to, the, to the reservoir where, where, you, where you put your, uh, your CO2. No? So, and uh, if we go uh, in terms of uh, technology, this slide show you, let's say, the different pieces of technology that uh, uh, we, which we engage with customers uh, in order to support them in their uh, carbon capture uh, and uh, utilization storage initiatives. No? So you go from uh, uh, process simulator symmetry uh, that is identified uh, with, uh, you know, the methane icon, uh, icon, methane icon, and then you have Olga for uh, uh, for uh, pipeline transport, and then you have Eclipse Intersect uh, for more uh, for uh, uh, for the reservoir part. And all these, because it's all belonging to the same company, we have a consistent approach uh, in terms of uh, supporting our customers in these initiatives. Now, obviously, I am, uh, let's say, the the one that is uh, uh, more. Uh, an expert as an expert is on uh, the process part and uh, on the, therefore on the symmetry part so the symmetry part if we go back uh, to the uh, uh, to the um, to the slides that represent the different uh, uh, disciplines uh, the symmetry part will cover everything that is related uh, to uh, modeling of co2 sources uh, so that can be power generation uh, or uh, anything uh, or process plants uh, generating uh, CO2. Then it, it covers CO2 separation. Uh, it, can mo it can model some in innovative processing, and we will talk about it uh, later on. It can model the part related to, to ship transport, uh, and finally to the compression system. No? Uh, this is uh, what normally symmetry covers in terms of functionalities. Uh, then the other technology that uh, uh, that uh, you um, that I've I've uh, I've put in this slide are instead covering so all gap pipe sim eclipse are are are, are basically covering the other uh, the other discipline. No? So if we go again into the details uh, of, uh, uh, of symmetry and what is related uh, to uh, CO2 uh, uh, capture and separation, uh, these are some of the examples that I put in this slide of functionality that symmetry covers uh, and that address uh, the area of CO2 uh, generation, CO2, capture, CO2 uh, sources. Uh, so you, in uh, symmetry, you can model everything, as, as I said, uh, related uh, to a process plant uh, or a power plant. 
uh, in the case of power plant, you can even model a bio, biogas, a biomass gasification or a waste gasification. Then you can model the path related to CO2 separation, so membranes, uh, cryogenic separation, chemical absorption by uh, amines. Uh, and then finally, you can also try to model uh, innovative ways uh, of thinking uh, about uh, um, CO2 uh, utilization, no? CO2 processing. No? Uh, and maybe in the next slide, I will find uh, a specific example about it. So all these are uh, cross uh, capabilities that are covered uh, by symmetry. And here in these slides, uh, in the next slide, I'm just showing some, some screenshots uh, taken from symmetry, so from our process simulator, that are related uh, to uh, some of the things that I explained in the previous slide. So for instance, in uh, uh, let me activate uh, my pointer actually. Um, so for instance, uh, the, uh, uh, the screenshot that you see here is uh, an example uh, taken from symmetry of a, uh, a biomass gasification plant uh, with its uh, related uh, um, uh, energy generation. Uh, and this is a source of CO2. Uh, now, this other example is again a screenshot taken from symmetry of a cryogenic separation because uh, uh, when you talk about uh, uh, CO2 uh, shipping, uh, uh, CO2 transport by ship, uh, uh, you want, let's say, to, to bring your CO2 to an to a almost liquid stage or to a liquid stage in order to minimize the volume that uh, uh, you want to use in your ship to, uh, to, uh, to transport uh, uh, CO2. Uh, and then finally, this is a, an example of a more innovative processing, what I was saying. So this is an example of natural gas uh, uh, used uh, in, uh, in reforming. Uh, in order to produce uh, hydrogen and CO2, then hydrogen and CO2 would be separated uh, by, uh, by a PSA unit, for instance, pressure, uh, pressure uh, uh, absorption, and, uh, um, and, and then your hydrogen would be used eventually in your turbine in order, uh, in order to uh, generate electricity. No? So this is uh, actually a scheme that is... Uh, uh, gaining popularity, uh, especially because of some of uh, uh, research projects uh, funded uh, by the European community, and where uh, symmetry, again, uh, uh, can be used in order to model every component, uh, going from the reforming component uh, to the separation of CO2 and hydrogen up to the uh, uh, hydrogen uh, usage in the turbine. Okay. Uh, and then finally, the last uh, uh, capture uh, I have in terms of simulation is, uh, is the compression part, because uh, we talk about uh, CO2 sources, uh, so generation of CO2, then separation of CO2, and finally, uh, compression of CO2 uh, in the reservoir. And uh, so symmetry has obviously functionalities to model compression trains in both states. Uh, and in dynamic. Um, so you can do studies related to, con to controllability, safety of your, uh, uh, of your compression systems, uh, opti optimization of uh, the design or the operation of uh, the interstage uh, of, uh, uh, of the compression system in order to minimize maybe energy consumption. consumption. And some of, uh, and I put also on the, um, on the right side of this slide, some of the thermodynamics uh, characteristics uh, that made us uh, the tool of choice uh, for some of the oil and gas majors. So we are um, engaging with some of the uh, oil and gas majors uh, in, uh, uh, in several areas in the world, also in Europe, uh, in order to, let's say, help them to, um, to, um, to, to support them in their engagement with CC, CCUS initiatives. And they chose us because thermodynamic accuracy. And you see, some of these points are very important, are very important when you treat uh, uh, CO2, when you study CO2 transport and CO2 processing. Um, so going back to the, to, the pre, to the initial slide, I want to say that, again, Schlumber, I, I've presented symmetry capabilities, but again, you have to think that, uh, that Schlumberger can support you in every single aspect uh, of the CCUS supply chain. Finally, for, for, uh, for contacting, I've put a final slide where, uh, where you can see where to contact us in terms of support or in terms of sales. 
and then finally i i turn uh, uh, to the uh, to the uh, question and answer section thank you very much uh, we do have a, a few questions in here uh, the first one is about uh, the main differences that you could shortlist uh, between symmetry and other process uh, simulation solutions uh, provided by third parties that we know very well are in the market. Yep. Okay. So basically, uh, just to uh, to be uh, to be very honest with you, the uh, first of all, symmetry has been built by some of the founders of some of. Uh, the process simulators that you probably are more familiar with. No? So when we rethought uh, about, uh, even myself in terms of experience, I come from uh, that kind of uh, hypertech uh, uh, background. Uh, so the same it would be for, this, for the people who built uh, Symmetry many, uh, few, 20 years ago. The Symmetry started to be adopted uh, 20 years ago, almost. And now in terms of differentiator, uh, so when we went to develop it, uh, we thought about uh, First of all, uh, what are the gaps uh, in terms of accuracy that uh, the other uh, simulators have? So we gave a lot of importance to thermodynamics. Uh, and again, CO2 is one of the areas that I've shown where uh, actually some of the oil and gas majors uh, tried uh, uh, symmetry versus other process simulators, uh, and uh, they engaged with us because they said uh, that was the best process simulator to model what they wanted to model. So first of all, accuracy on thermodynamics. Then second point uh, is... Uh, uh, the, the, the point that uh, uh, Nicolai mentioned, uh, integration. So uh, and the integration goes at two levels. The first level is that symmetry by itself uh, is uh, a, 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 a platform, uh, a software platform that has been thought in order to have uh, consistent thermodynamics uh, from uh, uh, oil and gas gathering systems uh, up to your flare analysis. Uh, passing through the process. So all that is under the same platform, the same thermodynamics, uh, steady state, uh, and dynamic engine. So in, in one simulation case, for instance, you can have a steady state uh, flow sheet and, uh, and a transient flow sheet at the same case. So that is the second point. But third point is the integration with Schlumberger. And this is something that, uh, uh, let's say, a uh, work in progress. We, uh, we are already uh, connecting symmetry to PipeSim uh, and uh, Olga, that you probably know. Um, and we are connecting uh, also to, uh, to Eclipse and uh, Reservoir Simulation uh, through uh, uh, integrated asset modeling. Uh, but uh, the, um, um, we are also in the stage of developing a, a consistent thermodynamic approach going from reservoir to, uh, to uh, process simulation. That means uh, uh, you know, adopting uh, what they are called the symmetry thermodynamics uh, to try to apply them uh, also not only to process uh, but also to uh, production with pipe cement and Olga and also in a certain sense uh, to, uh, to reservoir uh, even if uh, for the properties that you need. And so this is, uh, let's say, the other differentiator. And then finally, uh, the, the, the last differentiator that I would say, it, and again, it's, it's, it's a journey, is, uh, um, the, uh, let's say, our uh, relationship with uh, the services uh, part of uh, Schlumberger, and especially, you know, the, the, uh, the ex-Cameron guys uh, and who are designing the facilities uh, for, uh, uh, for, uh, uh, for, the, for the oil operator. And that is where we are putting together digital twins for, for, for the facility operators. Thank you for, for that. Uh, now that you talk about integration and the eventual uh, connectivity with, with other uh, products of, of the Schlumberger suite, uh, do you have any uh, guidance in terms of the timeline uh, to make available this integration with IAM and, and other uh, yes, suites? That's that's fine, yeah. The, uh, the integration with IAM is uh, there, is uh, available to everybody. And actually, uh, we have also a, a quite nice uh, case study with uh, Petronas uh, that is public, so I can say the name, uh, that has been done. And uh, um, so Petronas has developed, uh, a, a, let's say, consistent workflow from reservoir to, uh, to symmetry in order to uh, optimize the production of uh, certain fields. 
taking into consideration uh, the uh, the bottleneck that some of the facilities could uh, uh, could uh, could put in place. So that is already available to everybody. Uh, we are uh, in the stage. The development is now is especially focused on thermodynamics and trying to you know having a consistent uh, fluid approach from uh, let's say from a reservoir to uh, production with uh, pipe cement. And we will start, to be honest, with production, so with pipe cement and, and, and Olga, but we will get also to the, uh, to the reservoir world. Now that you mentioned that, uh, I believe that anybody who has been working with the production side and eventually with the process side uh, always complains, I am one of those, uh, that whatever fluid you you work uh, in your fluid modeling engine you always need to somehow customize tiny bits uh, to deploy it for pipe seam and then a tiny bit uh, different for deploying in the process uh, simulator whichever it is uh, this would be great news to yeah, have one fluid to rule right. them all yeah <laughs> you're right uh, and we know, you know, this, this concern uh, is not only Gulf concern, uh, it's also other, other customers have said exactly the same thing. So this is something uh, on which we are working on. Uh, I cannot say, I cannot promise a date because uh, this is a, a re, uh, R&D project that is ongoing, but certainly I would be very happy to, to share, let's say, the, uh, the, the milestones of this uh, R&D project. And I am completely sure that it be it will be very welcomed in the community, for sure. It it's will shorten the war and it will save many lives. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, good. Thank you very much, uh, Michel and Nicolas, uh, for this very interesting uh, presentation. Indeed, uh, it it is. <laughs>